Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to our Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. Uh, we're sitting here in lovely Nepal today with our next journey, our next place, a stop if you will, on the journey of these airplanes. With an interesting little airplane which uh, some of you may recognize from a particular movie that also happened to have something that took place very close to this region here. Uh, I'm not going to think it too loudly because all I have to say is travel by map and travel by John Williams. But we're looking today at the Ford Trimotor. Uh, this is a 1926 of course, uh, aircraft evolution kind of took off. Uh, we had a bunch of things that happened. The military, of course, took interest in airplane design uh, once they realized the effect of it in World War I. We had the first carrier kill, carrier-borne aircraft destruction of another airplane that came a little bit later on, which uh, one of those things that always fascinated me. Of course, we also had other developments. Uh, we had aircraft engines that started getting more powerful. Uh, radial engines started becoming much, much more popular. And of course, we had this thing called airlines, commercial airlines, ventures. So we're going to take a look at sort of the evolution of sort of the 1920s. And now the big thing that, of course, kind of kicked us off, too, was the evolution of airmail. Something, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of really good airmail planes. The Curtis Jenny would basically be a decent airmail plane for us. But all of a sudden, we needed a lot of pilots and we needed a lot of planes. And everybody was experimenting with airplanes at this time, including the Ford Motor Company. Now, the Ford Motor Company came out with this one, the Ford Trimotor. There's actually a lot of variations of the Ford Trimotor. And there's a lot of stuff that's changed uh, compared to uh, what we saw just a few years earlier, especially when we were looking at the Junkers F-13 there. One thing you'll notice is that we have a right engine. Yes, right, that right engine. And you'll notice the presence of the fact that we've got these big squishy landing gears. We're an all-metal fuselage. Notice that a fancy pants uh, corrugated metal is uh, still kind of in. Notice we have something new. We have lights. Yes, uh, we finally have exterior lights. Uh, we also have warnings and things like that. But again, this is a modernized version of this particular aircraft. So it's kind of a shame because uh, we lose out on some of kind of the fun little buttons and stuff like that. A lot of these instruments, even though they're pretty accurate for the time, um, again, some of this has been changed around to be a little bit simplified. You also notice we have passengers. And uh, for those of you who have ever ridden on trains before, probably say, hey, this looks kind of familiar. But notice what we've got here. We've got modern uh, little seats here. They're metal. They're bolted right to the floor. We have a little vent to let some of the heat in or the exhaust however that worked notice we have a toilet in the back which is fantastic we have these little reading lamps here and if you look up top oh, we have the kind of little place where you can put your luggage bins looking at the exterior of this airplane man this thing is uh, chunky look at those tires they're huge also notice um if we need to go faster what do we do we just added more engines seems legit but we had three engines of course anybody who flies multi-engine planes will tell you the fact that engines don't necessarily always move at the same rpm or anything convenient like that now, one thing I also love about this plane, too, that we don't get a good look at uh, materials-wise, there's actually a cabin where you can just open up and put things into the wing. We're starting to store fuel in other parts of the plane rather than in the fuselage or right next to the engine. And you'll also notice that we're starting to get a lot more attention to aerodynamics. You know, we're starting to get that kind of distinctive teardrop shape. And there's our cheeky fighter jet pilot uh, flying with us again today. But it's so impressive to see how much this has changed in such a short time. Notice, by the way, we still do not have trim tabs on the controls. All trim is done basically mechanically, old school. Also notice we still have no flaps. Uh, that's not a thing yet. And also notice we're still using cables for the purposes of moving our controls around. I love the fact I can crank this and actually get it to kind of wiggle on the ground. It's just so impressive. Inside the cabin, of course, uh, we've got some other things that are a little different. Uh, one thing I love the fact is I have a sliding window for the pilot. Uh, that's kind of different. I sort of like that. Uh, the other thing you'll notice, of course, is our instrumentation. Looks like they took this off a of Model T. Is we have some actual instruments like what we can think about as far as airplanes goes. You'll notice we have a height meter still uh, that's not quite the standard altimeter people think of uh, we have the clock of course we have a voltage system because now we have generators so we can actually produce our own electricity one thing I love here is I have an actual fuel tank gauges. I can see how much I'm carrying each one of it, including my reserve tank. I also have the ability to prime the cylinders from here. I don't have to climb out onto the wing to do it anymore, which I think is impressive. Notice my master ignition controls. I have a standardized mixture controls down here. I have my starters, which just like in the old days, you stepped on the starters to start them. You didn't pull them or twist them. It's just kind of how it went. Uh, we have a water rudder for emergencies. Of course, I don't need a water rudder because I'm not swimming with this particular airplane today. Don't have to worry about that. And just notice we have the presence of lights, like legitimate lights that can actually help us out. Our instruments, of course, are still really old-fashioned, so they're wiggling and waggling everywhere. Uh, notice I actually have a decent landing approach indicator. This is a very, very early model. We're starting to see some instrument navigational techniques as well. We have things like vertical speed, and of course, our airspeed is measured in MPHs, which is a very interesting unit. We also have, of course, a compass, but things like the directional gyro, 
Not a thing yet. Uh, not a thing yet. So uh, we're still fighting with some of the older technologies. But the other thing you'll notice, too, is uh, when I turn my head around, notice our fuel systems are still pretty convoluted. You know, I've got an equalizer system here. I've got my left tanks. You'll notice my pitch trim does exist, but it's behind me. It's actually a screw style. Uh, you have a little indicator above your head. Well, by be above behind your head, so you can actually see that component. You'll also see, again, the fuel selector. So these systems are still a little convoluted and a little bit challenging to maintain. Now, we don't have retractable landing gear yet. We still don't have flaps, but let's get this thing in the air. Da, 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 da. So we're gonna get this thing rolling uh, relatively straightforward. Again, uh, very, very short takeoff runs on these early airplanes here. And uh, one of the nice things is, is, again, we can actually carry things in the back of this plane. I no longer am I worried about just carrying myself. Uh, things I'll notice right away, of course, is that since we've gotten a little bit bigger and our airplane's all metal, is a lot of that kind of early days uh, sort of sensitivity has kind of gone away. Uh, when I go ahead and I move my control to the right, it gets going. But again, they're very heavy controls. Uh, these are not boosted controls. They're not trimmed controls. Uh, but they're not aerodynamic airfoils or anything nice and fancy like that. It's just the absolute basics when this goes. And of course, uh, one thing you'll notice is we still do not have constant speed propellers. We hadn't developed that yet. Uh, actually, this technology, I take it back. We had the early days of constant speed propellers. I should be more specific variable art, um, pitch propellers, which are actually very interesting. I don't have a good example of one I can fly to demonstrate, sadly. But again, uh, take a look at our controls. Uh, like I say, we have the directional gyro, a very early day version of it. It's kind of doing its thing there, even though it's not doing a very good job dealing with my corners. Um, the amount of rudder required to stabilize this plane is epic. Uh, when I sit there and actually kick it to the left, oh my gosh, my rudder pedal's halfway deflected. I never have to push a rudder pedal that far. But we are getting the foundations of decent performing controls here. I can actually level ourselves off and head towards the Himalayas there, get that all set up. Uh, we still have no attitude indicator, not a thing, which is kind of a shame. And our model of the uh, Ford, by the way, the Tri-Motors is a later model, so it's a little bit fancier than the one God. But I notice I can pull my throttle back to about 75%. I have an accurate way to measure that. I have an accurate way to measure the amount of fuel. Of course, accurate is all relative. And one of the things I always got a kick out of all these airplanes of this era is um, the idea of mounting instruments exterior to the plane or not to the plane, on the exterior of the plane. You'll actually notice that uh, my RPM is over here. My oil pressures and temperatures are on the engines themselves. And again, uh, actually the uh, response in this particular case here. But it's just so different that it's uh, mounted like this as opposed to in the cabin. But I still can see um, the instrument that you're looking there on the right is actually for the front engine, not the back engine or, or the side engine. And I love the fact that I just have a sliding window. So if I want to blow a bunch of air in my face, which would make it very uncomfortable and very loud, uh, we have the ability to do that. Again, things you're not going to see. Also notice we're all square and rectangly, which makes it really easy to build, but it makes it a lot less aerodynamic. A lot of those aerodynamic innovations that we're going to get later on, uh, you're going to start to see, especially on the nose of the plane, as these things get a little bit better. Coming out this side, of course, uh, you can see got a whole set. And I love the wheels on this thing and the giant suspension. I like in order to reduce drag, they put this little guy here to improve the stability of this entire little piece coming off the side of the wing here. It's really, really impressive to see all the little efforts they're trying to basically put into it to improve the safety and stability of these airplanes. Now, this is, of course, uh, like I was mentioning, the first Model T, or Model T, I'm not going to speak to that, first Ford Tri-Motor came out in 1926. But what's incredible is watch what happens when we fast forward just a few more years. One of the real challenges with aircraft in the 20s, especially, and oh, even well into the 30s and 40s, was the lack of available airfields. So one of the solutions, of course, to this was to simply use uh, bodies of water for the purpose of giant airfields. So you started to see a lot of flying boats come out in that particular era. And there's actually several available to us. The one I've decided to go with is a Dornier 10 here, which is a great example. It's actually a 1929 model. So there's a lot of problems, of course, with making a boat that also flies. Uh, the number one problem, of course, is it's got to float safely and take off from well, land on water. And you can see how they did what they could to basically make it a boat shape. The other problem, of course, is we needed enough lift for something like that. And all you can see just the huge size of our wing here. And of course, we're going to need a lot of power, a lot of power. And when I say a lot of power, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, how about 12 engines? 12 engines seems legit. Uh, this aircraft is so powerful and so potent. It actually has multiple decks on it, which I think is uh, very interesting here. You can actually open this up. We'll go down there in a second here. But we have an engine room back here. And not only do we have an engine room, but we can actually go back even further. We have a navigation room, uh, like a little kind of radio room. And you can go all the way back here, and there's actually an APU, uh, just giving you an idea of the change of scale of this airplane 
same compared to everything we saw just a few years prior. Now, when we come down to the passenger deck, again, I think back to the trains here, this looks more like a cabin cruiser than it looks on nose, by the way. You probably recognize that style chair. We have a full galley in the nose here. Uh, you can see this uh, hideous wallpaper that kind of sits all over the place, uh, which I find kind of interesting. And just, you know, uh, no safety belts, so just kind of wood chairs and everything like that. And of course, we sit up here and uh, we can see the other innovations that went along with it. One thing you'll notice here is the corrugated metal. We still got the corrugated. Uh, nothing we can do about that. We'll have to deal with the drag. Our navigation technology has also gotten better along with our instrumentation. You'll notice we have some farts here. Uh, this is a kilometers, this is our altitude, which is uh, kind of handy. Of course, we have our uh, vertical speed indicator. We finally have a proper turn coordinating gyro. Yes, we have generators now. We have ourselves all sorts of handy tools here as far as uh, determining our ground distance. We have our wind. We have height. We, of course, have our directional controls. We have an attitude indicator. Look at that. And uh, coming over here, of course, we have two different versions of the attitude indicator. We have a proper clock uh, sitting up there. It's illuminated. You also notice the presence of these nice stabilized uh, compass tools. But more importantly, our navigation is provided by a built-in navigator who has one of these. Uh, for those of you not from with this. This is a sextant. Uh, this is for measuring the angle of the horizon to a particular object in the sky. Typically stars, the moon, the sun, all those are very handy. And of course, we have this really, really nice heading select as well as a navigational diary. These aircraft went from, you know, flying a couple hours to literally flying for hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, some of these planes could be airborne, you know, 15, 16, 17 hours. Uh, one thing I really get a kick out of, if you look straight ahead there, you can see our little airspeed indicator uh, getting all spun up there. So fascinating. You can see a giant radio loop. We are still starting to get radio antennas at this point. So we're starting to get kind of the early, 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 early days of um, you know, navigational tools. Of As a pilot here, um, of course, uh, one of the things I have to do is, ah, there we go, much better is I have to change my controls because we have 12 engines on board. I have to actually tweak it. And I love how instead of measuring like airspeed when we have to rotate or something like that, we basically set a stopwatch and uh, we wait for this thing to uh, pick up enough speed for the purposes of uh, getting it back up into the air. And again, it's so wild because you got to imagine how much physical strength it took to tug this thing to actually get us into the air. And I love the fact that we have a little tugboat that we can summon. You got our two attackometers there down on the floor. And like I said, uh, we've got to get ourselves back up on step here. So I'm going to go try to climb this airplane onto the step. Very challenging to do. And again, you can see, ah, there it goes. Just starting to hop up on step here. And it gives you an idea of just how much distance these aircraft took. Now, these flying boats were a very, very popular choice for a long time because we didn't have a lot of sophisticated asphalt and uh, fancy runways that we had earlier, kind of a thing like that. You know, we were still sort of in the early days of all of this. So we're trying to find ways to find room so we can get an airplane this large that we barely can get into the air, as you're probably observing, into the air. Uh, the other thing you're going to notice is that we still do not have flaps. You know, this aircraft is uh, something that definitely could benefit from some flaps. Uh, there we go, we're bop up. Now we gotta go ahead and take advantage of some ground effect here, giving us moments, stabilize, and now we're on our way. Isn't that amazing just how long these things would take to go? And again, there were so many flying boats of this era. And the reason more, like I said, we didn't have really good spots. As long as we had water, we could safely land. You also had some really bad accidents in this era because of these aircraft need to take off from water because there are things in the water. And if it takes you two and a half miles to get airborne, you have a fairly good idea of just how dangerous that can be. So as we have seen in the 1920s, Materials are staying more or less the same, especially as the airplanes got a little bit bigger. Uh, we got these kind of all metal planes now. We've got some standardization of controls. Uh, ailerons are pretty much fixed. Still no flaps. Uh, we still do not have constant speed RPM engines yet. Um, they're still around, but um, like I said, for this particular model, we don't have them. They're certainly not nearly as standardized as we saw later on. Of course, you still have all the reliability problems. Uh, you have much, much larger crews. Uh, you have engines just shutting themselves off on each other, issues with materials, issues with navigation. Comfort was better because at least things are a little enclosed. Now, once we get to the 30s, uh, something else is going to innovate and uh, change things around quite dramatically for us. But that is in our next episode of the Evolution of Aircraft Design with Microsoft Flight Simulator.